to speak. Um, so it, uh, I, first I want to welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, it's really my pleasure to present um, Melissa for her master's defense. Um, I would like to start off though by talking a little bit about how I got to know Melissa. Uh, it, it just kind of shows how small this world really is. Um, some of you are probably aware that I work in South Africa part of the year uh, at the University of Pretoria. And the guy who runs the institute there that I work in, uh, his name is Mike Wingfield, he's one of the top forest, not forest, but plant pathologists in the world. And uh, the guy is pretty amazing, so when he says things, I actually listen. <laughs> and so he happened to be in California at UC Davis doing a sabbatical right about the time I was awarded an NSF proposal to look at how temperature and climate change affect mountain pine beetle fungi. And so uh, he knew that I was looking for a PhD student to work on a project, and so he emailed me and said, hey, you got to talk to Melissa. And I said, but Melissa's going to be a master's student, and I really need a PhD student. And he says, no, you should really talk to Melissa. <laughs> and so because I listened to Mike, um, I talked to Melissa, and pretty quickly was convinced that she would be a really good fit. And so she ended up coming here to UM to work on a project um, and doing absolutely an enormous amount of work because she did take on um, a project that was meant for a PhD student. Um, <laughs> there's more to it actually than she's going to show you today because this was actually a big cooperative project between Utah State University and the Forest Service and UM. And so there's a field component, um, there's a modeling component, there's a whole bunch of stuff that Melissa worked on as well as this. Um, so realize that in two and a half years she did a pretty remarkable amount of work. Um, so. Um, it's really been nice to have Melissa in the lab. She's very good, she's very bright. Uh, she works amazingly hard. But something else that's really nice about Melissa is something that anybody that's advised students can appreciate, and that is that you can be bright and good, but if you're not, you know, not a good lab citizen, it can cause you know, problems. But she is just remarkable. She's just incredibly nice. She works well with people. Um, she's always a pleasant presence in the lab, and so it's going to be um, kind of sad to lose that, that nice presence, but you can come back and visit. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I'll turn things over to Melissa and let her tell you what she's been up to for the last couple of years. Thank you. That was really sweet. So I'm Melissa, I'm working on, this is uh, my master's thesis presentation, uh, defense. The title is Temperature Effects on Growth and Sporulation in Our Resource Capture During Intraspecific and, and Intraspecific Competition by the Fungal Symbionts of the Mountain Pine Beetle. So before I get started, I'm going to go through some definitions. Most of you are familiar with the concept of a symbiosis, which is a living together of two unlike organisms. But a multipartite symbiosis is a symbiosis where there is one host that, contain, that um, is in contact with multiple symbionts, and the symbionts are of different species. These are incredibly common in nature, and um, it's not quite understood how they're, they're stable, because if you have multiple symbionts that you carry with you, you'd expect them to compete with each other. However, this doesn't appear to be the case in a lot of situations, so it's hypothesized that environmental conditions, um, their variability allow uh, symbionts to exist at different times and thus remain in symbiosis with their host. Here's a couple examples. On the left is coral. Um, coral is in association with zooxanthellae, and uh, these microorganisms have been shown to vary with light temperature and depth. And on the right, uh, mycorrhizal associates of a seedling here, and mycorrhizae are known to vary. Uh, the species found in association with the seedling are known to vary based on moisture, nutrients, elevation, and temperature. My third example is opiostomatoid fungi. These are fungi that grow in the phloem and saploid of conifers. A lot of them are symbiotic with bark beetles, and the mountain pine beetle in particular, this guy right here, is symbiotic with uh, two fungal species. And these two fungal species are known to vary with temperature as well. 
So I think before we start talking about the fungi, I, sh I should explain the mountain pine beetle life cycle so you can understand why the fungi are important to this insect. Mountain pine beetle, um, if we're talking about a life cycle, we can pick any arbitrary point to start with. We'll start with the adult phase. The adults emerge from their natal host tree um, and disperse to a new host tree. Once they find a host tree, they'll attack en masse. You won't find one beetle attacking the tree, you'll find many. And they bore through the um, bark of the tree, and this right here is pitch and grass that are pushed out as the beetle bores into the tree. Once it gets through the bark, it starts tunneling upwards through the floor. This is the beetle right here, you can kind of see it in the picture. And as it's tunneling upwards in the phloem, it's inoculating the phloem with fungi that it carries in its mouth parts. And as it's inoculating with fungi carried in its mouth parts, the females are also laying eggs. You can see there's a couple eggs along the gallery right there. So um, this is the adult gallery right here, tunneling vertically upwards. And um, these galleries coming off the sides are the larval galleries, where the, the adult has laid eggs, larvae have hatched, and have begun tunneling through the phloem. Um, at the same time that the larvae are tunneling through the phloem, the fungi that the parent inoculated along the gallery is also tunneling or traveling through the phloem to capture resources. Um, not only does the uh, fungus capture resources in the phloem, but it also goes into the tree, into the sapwood of the tree, collects resources there, and then translocates it to the phloem where the larvae are developing. And this is important for the larvae because phloem colonized by the fungi is higher in nitrogen than phloem uncolonized by the fungi. And nitrogen is typically the most limiting resource for herbivorous insects. So it's very important that these larvae feed on phloem colonized by fungi so that they can develop properly. Once they've consumed enough resources and experienced enough degree days, which is a metric for understanding how temperature affects their, um, their development, they'll pupate at the end of these chambers. They'll create a little pupation chamber and uh, create their pupa. So um, after they have closed from their pupa, they will gap, they'll start feeding on spores that have emerged in their pupal chamber. Um, they have specialized mouth. So this is this is the bottom of the face of a, of a mountain pine needle. And these are mouth parts right here that um, contain an organ called the maxillary uh, cardi. And that's a close-up of that organ right here. And in the maxillary cardi, there's a small pocket called the mycangia. And mycangia are um, able to store spores. So while the new, newly emerged adults are feeding on spores, they're passively collecting spores in their mycangia. This is important because this allows the adults to vector fungal spores from one host tree to the next host tree. Once they've collected the spores, they'll emerge from the tree and look for a new host and then inoculate that tree with the fungus that it carried from the, the previous tree. Another thing that's interesting is that because the beetles have these specialized organs, we know that the beetle has been in symbiosis with the fungus for a long enough period of evolutionary time to develop these specialized organs. So these are the fungal associates, the stars of the show. Um, the mountain pine needle carries asexual spores, which is another important point because they carry clonal um, spores from one host tree to the next, so they're bringing the fungus with it that, um, that it encountered in its beautiful chamber. On the left here, this is Grossmannia clavidra. This fungus grows best between 15 and 25 degrees Celsius, which feels like about a little bit above and below room temperature. And this fungus provides more nitrogen than the other species of fungus. Opiostum amontium, on the other hand, grows at higher temperatures, um, a little bit higher than room temperature, and it provides less nitrogen. And as I said earlier, nitrogen is very important for beetle development during the larval stage. So once the um, beetles find a tree, they will bo um, bore into it, as I said earlier, and the interesting thing about their attack pattern is that they kind of know how far apart they are. They have regularly spaced intervals around the bowl of the tree. You wouldn't find a beetle attacking the tree right next to another guy. They're, they're spaced out pretty evenly. And um, so the beetles will bring the fungus into the tree and then the fungus will start growing out. This blue area right here represents the fungus. And um, so the, the fungal colonies will grow out 
and they'll stop once they meet each other. They won't capture resources from each other. Um, they are able to defend the resources that they've captured in the face of the competitor and uh, undergo deadlock once they meet. So getting back to larval nutrition, as I said, it's very important for the larva to have adequate nitrogen during their development. This because it, that's because it affects their size as adults. Um, adult size has been correlated with egg laying capacity. So the better fed a larva is, the larger it's gonna be as an adult, the more eggs it's going to lay. <coughs> Um, so this graphic right here that I drew, um, is anyone here colorblind? Awesome, okay. <laughs> <laughs> change all your red. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had <laughs> Montium in red to match all the red Montium, but I, I wanted people to be able to see it. So pretend that this is a cross section of flow over here. These are the, the galleries, the adult galleries, and then the, lar the larval galleries are horizontal. And pretend this black area is Grossmannia phloem colonized by Grossmannia cubitra and the red area is flown colonized by Opiostum amontium. So if you look at this picture, um, you see like these guys right here, they develop mostly on Grossmannia clavidra, and these guys right here develop mostly on Opiostum amontium. So these guys are probably gonna be bigger than these guys, and they're probably gonna be able to develop, to lay more eggs. However, if you look at the population overall, if you looked at all the beetles, you'd be able to, um, there would be a relative prevalence of beetles feeding on one species or the other species. So you'd be able to estimate overall the, um, the, size, the uh, population structure. So um, you're probably wondering what, what influences the relative prevalence of the two fungal associates that wind up growing in the tree. And this is influenced by the relative prevalence of the two um, species of spores that are brought in initially by adults that construct the adult gallery when they um, when they are tunneling, they'll bring in spores. And also the environmental conditions during the um, colonization of the tree will affect the relative prevalence. So you could have more of Ophiostum montium brought in, but if it's cooler, you'll find out there's more Grossmannia clavidra um, in the tree after it's been fully colonized. So, given that the two fungal associates subsist on the same substrate, we'd expect that they would compete with each other. However, no evidence of interference competition has occurred in the past. Interference competition occurs a lot of times with fungi. For example, penicillin will produce antibiotics that it injects into the media around it, and these antibiotics prevent other um, species of, of microbes to colonize the territory that it, it wants to keep for itself. Another form of interference competition is um, creation of a barrage zone. And a barrage zone is basically a physical barrier where hyphae are piled up and create sort of a wall that prevents other species from capturing the resources that the barrage creator has captured. So we haven't seen that with either of these two species at all, ever. What we do see is exploitation competition. And this is where environmental conditions will influence the outcome of competition between the two associates. And it's interesting because even though competition is occurring, exploitation competition is occurring, neither fungus has been lost from the symbiosis. If you look um, through evolutionary time, they've, they've remained in association with a mountain pine beetle, and there's phylogenetic evidence of that. So I'd like to pose a question. If competition should lead to exclusion, is it possible that environmental conditions allow the fungi to remain in symbiosis over time by allowing them to grow at different times. So to ask that question, I looked into uh, prior research. I found that there were quite a few um, studies conducted already where they found that temperature affects um, the relative prevalence of the two fungi. These studies right here, Adams and Six, Leiker and Six, they found that when you looked at the phloem next to beetles that were developing in the field, if it was cooler, you'd be more likely to find Grossmannia clavidra, and if it was warmer, you'd be more likely to find Opiostum amontium. Then, this study in 2007, Six and Vince, they found that when they collected adults that were dispersing, if you looked at the, um, depending on temperature, if it was warmer, you'd be more likely to find adults carrying Opiostum amontium, and when it's cooler, you're more likely to find adults carrying Grossmannia clavidra. There have been several studies which have backed this up in vitro, They've been able to determine the, um, the 
the temperature that these fungi grow best at. However, all of these studies have been conducted using considerably smaller sample sizes than I decided to use. For example, this is a figure from Solheim and Crocani in 1998. Um, each one of these lines, oh, this is the, the y-axis is growth rate in millimeters per day, and the x-axis is temperature. The black filled in is Grossmanni Covidra, and the white empty is Ophiostoma montium. But the thing that's important to note here is that each line represents one isolate. So for this study, they had a sample size of two um, for the two associates. And as you can see, there's a little bit of variability in the optimal growth rate for Grossmanni and Covidra, suggesting that we might want to look at um, more isolates in the population. Oh, but they were able to to show that the optimal growth for Grossmanni clavigera is about five degrees lower than the optimal growth for Ophiostoma montium. So based on these previous temperature studies, I'd like to pose another question. Um, is it possible that the two fungi exhibit differing temperature profiles such that fluctuations in temperature allow them to capture resources at different times? And this led to my hypothesis that differential temperature tolerances allow each fungus to capture resources differently as temperatures fluctuate over time. Um, if conditions are variable, this would allow success for each of the two symbionts at different times. And the result of this would be that neither of the two symbionts would be lost from the symbiosis with the mountain pine beetle. And this benefits the mountain pine beetle because as temperatures fluctuate, it wants to make sure that it makes sure that it always has an associate. If it has, um, if, it, if temperatures get very warm and Grossmannia clavigera can't grow, at least it still has Ophiostoma montium, and at least it still has a fungal associate that can supplement its diet. So, to, the, to uh, support my hypothesis, the data I collected um, was uh, the effects of temperature on fungal fitness. The parameters I looked at for fungal fitness were growth rate in isolation with no other um, influence, and sporulation, growth rate during competition being influenced by a competitor, and the outcome of competitive interactions. As well as looking at all these metrics, I also wanted to look at the range and variability for all of these fitness parameters because they have not been looked at in the past. In addition to uh, the ecological implications of the study, there are also some very interesting practical applications. So um, my study is determining the effects of temperature on the relative prevalence of the two fungal associates. And we know that the relative prevalence of the two fungal associates affects larval nutrition, which affects adult fecundity, which has implications in predicting mountain pine beetle population dynamics in the future. To conduct my study, I collected 88 isolates of the two species. All of my isolates were collected either from mycangial dissections or from phloem isolated from, mount, uh, from mountain pine beetle infested trees. All of the isolates were isolated by single spore isolation, and then identified using cultural characteristics such as morphology. I collected from three separate locations. Um, the reason that I did this was because I wanted to see if population substructuring was occurring. So I looked at um, three very far apart locations. Here's Lubrecht Experimental Forest, and where we live, uh, Vipon Park, which is way down here in Montana, and then Stump uh, Hollow, which is in Logan, Utah. Population substructuring basically is where there, um, there's less gene flow occurring between populations than you would expect to see. Before I used each of the isolates in um, my experiment, I grew them out for five days. The reason that I did this was because when fungi are stored in cold conditions, they'll undergo a lag phase, where the growth rate doesn't really change very much, or the, the growth rate is very slow over time. But once it's taken out of incubation, or taken out of cold conditions, and it senses the media around it, and it's warmer, it starts to, the growth rate starts to change over time. This curved line right here is the exponential phase. And that would introduce variability. I wanted to miss that entirely. I didn't want to collect data from the exponential phase. So I waited five days, to only collect data from the linear phase, where the growth rate is consistent over time, thus removing any variability. So to determine the effects of temperature on growth rate in isolation, I used 50 isolates of Grossmannia clavidra, 30 of Ophiostoma montium, 
And um, for uh, each isolate, I would take a plug of mycelia colonized agar and put it in the center of a dish and let it grow out for 10 days. Every day I would visit my plates and I would trace a line around how far out the, the colony had grown that day. And, um, and I looked at the temperatures five through 35 degrees Celsius. Then I was able to, at the end of the 10 days, I took a picture of each one of these plates, uploaded it onto my computer, and then was um, able to determine the growth rate in area over time using regression analysis. For the effects of temperature and growth rate, I looked at all of the run-of-the-mill descriptive statistics, and I also conducted a mixed model analysis of variance on the relative growth rate, natural log of the growth rate. Uh, for the mixed model, isolate was my random variable, and the variables that I looked at affecting growth rate were temperature, species, and site, as well as all of their interactions, and I followed the interactions with uh, two keys, honestly, significant difference post hoc tests. So I know that two of these tests are pretty conservative, so I wanted to conduct an additional test to look at differences between sites. A drop in deviance test is a little bit more sensitive than the two keys uh, honestly significance test. Um, and basically this is where I compare a full model um, containing site as a variable to a reduced model lacking site as a variable. And um, if they're um, different, we know that site is um, affecting the the growth rate. Um, so I conducted these drop and deviance tests for the two species separately. So here are the results of my descriptive statistics. On the y-axis is millimeters squared per day, uh, growth rate per day. Um, the x-axis is temperature. Um, each of these lines runs along the mean for each species. This one is Ophiophila montium, and the black one is Grossmannia quadridra. The vertical lines are the 95% confidence intervals of the mean, and each one of those dots is an individual isolate. So for Grossmannia quadridra, the greatest growth rate was observed at 21 degrees, and for Ophiophila montium, the greatest growth rate was observed at 30 degrees. Most of the is most isolates of both species grew between 5 and 30 degrees. Um, some isolates of both species failed to grow at 5 degrees, and quite a few isolates of Grossmannia clavidra failed to grow at 30 degrees, which I thought was interesting. Um, however, neither of the species were able to grow at 35 degrees, so I removed those observations from my analysis of variance. And one thing you'll notice in this chart is there's a lot of variability for both species. Each one of these dots represents an individual isolate, so you can see there's a lot of variability at each temperature. So when I looked at the effects of temperature on growth rate using my analysis of variance, um, I found that temperature was significant. However, this, this is going to be significant for a lot of the models in the future. So I'm just going to say right now that temperature basically is saying that at 5, it grows differently at 5, then it grows at 10, then at 15, which is interesting for fungi, but not interesting for my experiment. So I wanted to know not just the effects of temperature, but the effects of temperature and species. So when I looked at the interaction between temperature and species, and followed with post hoc tests, I found specifically that at 30 degrees, Ophiostoma montium grew significantly faster than Grossmannia clavidra, and at 10 degrees, Grossmannia clavidra grew significantly faster than Ophiostoma montium. Uh, my analysis of variance did find um, an interaction between temperature and site, and um, my post hoc test did not find any differences between the sites at the same temperature. Even though there was significance there, the significance was once again between temperatures, which is interesting for fungi, but not interesting for my study. So you'll see this a lot, so I'm just going to explain it right now and remind you of it later. Temperature in site is significant a lot, but not interesting biologically for this experiment. For the drop in deviance test, um, it was a little more sensitive, and it did find that there was a significant difference between sites for Ophiostoma montium only. And when I followed up with t-tests, I found, indeed, Vicon Park, isolates from Vicon Park grew slower overall than isolates from Lubrecht Experimental Forest. If you look at this figure right here on the right, this is Grossmannia clavidra, this is growth rate per day, and this is temperature, and each one of these lines represents a site. And there's, stuff is being a little weird at 15, but for the most part, 
they're very similar temperature profiles. On the right is Ophiospa montium, and you can see a much greater difference between the temperature profiles for the species, especially Lubric experimental forest grows a lot faster overall than isolates from Viacom Park. So what does this all mean? There's a high amount of variability, which is interesting, and there's more variability in Ophiospa montium than Grosmani clipidra. In addition, I saw evidence of population substructuring for Ophiospa montium, but not for Grosmani clipidra. Um, this is not surprising because, as I failed to mention earlier, even though the, both of the fungi produce clonal spores that are carried by the beetles, from time to time, under special conditions, Ophiostoma montium is able to produce sexual spores. When sexual recombination occurs, you are left with an isolate that was different, uh, an, in, a genetic individual that was different from the one that uh, produced it. So because Ophiostoma montium is able to reproduce sexually, this explains the higher amount of variability that we see for this species. Because we see this high amount of variability, this um, leads to the conclusion that there's potential for adaptation for the two species, um, which is important considering um, changes in climate. Another thing that I want to point out was, um, this is the figure from the Solheimian and Crocaney 1998 paper. And um, I found a, a very similar temperature profile to them, however, for their two isolates of Ophiostoma montium, they, they peaked at a, about five degrees lower than they did for my study. See mine peak at 30, theirs peak about 25. So I think it's good that we looked at a lot of our isolates because we wouldn't have been able to see that if we had not. So as I mentioned earlier, Grossmanian clavigera does better at cooler temperatures. Ophiostoma montium does better at higher temperatures. However, in the middle here, there's uh, quite a few temperatures where they exhibit comparable resource temperature between 15 and 25 degrees. So we'd expect that the temperatures were to remain very cool over time and not rise at all, Ophiosma montium would be lost from the system. If the temperatures remain very high, Gosmania clubidra would be likely to be outcompeted and lost from the system. However, because in the real world temperatures do fluctuate and there is an area in between where they exhibit comparable resource capture, um, this most likely explains why we see both of them remaining in the symbiosis and not being competed. So for my sporulation study, I used the same plates that I used in the growth rate portion of the study. However, I grew them out for four more days because sporulation typically takes longer. Um, so to collect spores, I added deionized water to each of the plates, a known amount of water to each of the plates, and I use a sterile bent glass rod to dislodge the spores and um, let them fall into solution into the water. And then I collected the spore solution and agitated it to disperse the spores. And then I injected my spore solution into a humus cytometer, which is a microscope slide with a known amount of volume that allows me to count the number of spores per unit volume. So this is, a, this is what it looks like under the microscope. And each of these would be a spore and I would count them and then scale it up to the unit the known amount of volume that I added to the dish initially. Then I was able to scale the um, spores per unit volume to spores per unit area by scaling it by the area of the colony that the spores were obtained from. I conducted the normal descriptive statistics and also conducted a mixed model analysis of variance once again with isolate as a random effect. Um, I followed with two of these post-op tests, however, I did not conduct comparisons between the two species because fungi are known to sporulate differentially depending on the media that they're grown on, and comparing the two species could introduce bias. So, this is my results and discussion for the sporulation study. On the y-axis is spores per unit area, and the x-axis is temperature. The pink line is, runs along the mean for Ophiostoma montium. And the blue line runs along the mean for Grossmanni clavidra, and each of these dots is an individual isolate. So for both species, the greatest mean sporulation occurred at 30 degrees for both species. Um, they are both highly variable in their sporulation potential, especially at higher temperatures. Grossmanni clavidra began sporulating at 15 degrees and peaked at 30. However, Ophiosma montium exhibited no definitive peak in sporulation at any of the temperatures. Um, 
And I think it's interesting that Ophiophyll montium did was able to sporulate a little bit at the smaller temperatures. However, it's hard to say. So, um, moving along to my competition study. When I looked at the effects of temperature on competition between the two species, um, I looked at two uh, parameters. I looked at growth rate as well as percent resource capture. Um, changes in growth rate as the two species are growing towards each other would indicate that they are sensing each other somehow. And um, the percentage of resource capture that each, each species is able to capture overall indicates the outcome of competitive interactions between them in exploitation competition. So to look at competition in a more biologically meaningful way, I looked at the way that the, the fungi are colonized in a tree. So as I said earlier, the beetles um, bore through the tree in regular intervals around the bowl. So these, fung these fungal colonies are evenly spaced around the bowl of the tree. So I created a competition um, arena that mimics the way that the fungi grow in the tree. This is a 100 millimeter diameter petri dish with a 55 millimeter diameter petri dish in the center, and I poured agar in a ring between the two dishes, mimicking this bowl right here. And then I put um, plugs of agar containing mycelium evenly spaced around the ring of agar for intraspecific competition, this is competition within a species, for example, Ophiostoma montium growing against itself. I used four plugs of the same isolate. For interspecific competition, this would be Grossmannia clavigera versus Ophiostoma montium. I used two plugs of each species in alternation from each other. So these would be the same, and these would be the same. And then looked at how they grew towards each other. I used 30, iso 30 isolates of each species from the three sites. Um, and I wanted to look at the range of temperatures where both of the fungi are known to grow. So I wanted to look at 10 through 30. However, knowing that many isolates of Grossmannia clavigera fail to grow at 30 degrees, if I were to look at comparisons at this temperature, it would introduce bias. So I only looked at 10 through 25 degrees. So, um, I'm going to explain how I measured linear growth rate and percent resource capture. So um, this is the plug of one isolate, and this is the plug of the opposite isolate. I would put them in the incubator, and then I'd visit them daily. And I would draw a line tangential to fungal growth and perpendicular to the inner dish every day. So this is day one, day two, day three. And then at the end, after they'd met, I put a line through the middle. <coughs> the line was pretty easy to see between the two because they melanized differently. And um, so then I looked at the, the distance captured over time to give me an estimate of their growth rate. Um, and then I looked at their relative growth rate, the natural log of, of millimeters per day. For percent resource capture, I looked at the distance between this one isolate and the total distance that this one isolate captured, which would be from here to where it met up with the blue guy. And then I divided this by the total distance between the two isolates and divided this by 100. And then within a plate, I would average within a species. For my data analysis, um, I conducted data analysis for both percent resource capture as well as relative growth rate. Um, and I used mixed model analysis of variances with isolate as a random factor. I conducted, um, for Ophiostoma montium, I looked at these, these two metrics. For Grossmannia clavigera, I looked at these two metrics. And then these were the interactions that I looked at for both of those two species. In addition, I did a between species comparison of the two species only during interspecific competition, competing with each other, and looked at these interactions. So, at the end of my experiment, I, I wanted to see if there was any evidence of interference competition. I didn't see any. There was no necrosis, which is die-off due to antibiotics produced by one of the colonies, or barrage zones, which is the piling up of hyphae for creating a physical barrier. And I didn't see evidence of that in any of the competition treatments for any of the species. The only really interesting thing I saw was that for Grossmannia clavigera, only during intraspecific competition, when it was competing against itself, 
um, there would be a zone lacking melanin where the two colonies would meet. So there's a plug here and a plug here, and they're growing towards each other. And once they meet up, their hyphae um, touch. There's there's hyphae growing here. However, both colonies fail to deposit melanin in this area. Um, I looked into the literature. I haven't found anything referring to this. However, it was very consistent for all the interspecies <coughs> competition treatments of Rosmania clavigera. This figure here shows the way that Grossmannia clavigera, um, how the growth rate of Grossmannia clavigera approaching Opiosma montium or approaching itself. The, the, each of these dots is the mean in growth rate, y-axis is growth rate, x-axis is temperature, and these error bars represent um, the standard error of the mean. The black are in ter-specific, Grossmannia against Opiosma and the gray are intraspecific, Grosmania against itself, and I labeled each of these means with a letter. If the letters are the same, that means that they're not significantly different. If the letters are different, that means the means are significantly different from each other. So once again, temperature was significant, but not biologically interesting. The interaction between temperature and site was um, significant, and when I conducted post hoc tests, I did find one incident where at 10 degrees, Isolates from stump hollow grew faster than isolates from Lubrecht experimental forest. For Ophiostoma montium, the x and y axis are once again growth rate over temperature. Temperature was significant, um, as well as competition treatment with uh, montium growing faster with itself than with Postmonia clavigera. However, when I followed with Tukey's post hoc tests, I wasn't able to find any differences between the two at each temperature. So it was an overall opi opiosmum uh, faster during intra than inter, but not at these two, C, A, A, not significantly different at each temperature. Um, so if, if you remember when I was showing you that there was a significant interaction for Grossmannia clavigera in one incidence, in contrast, opiosmum montium, there were several interactions involving site where um, where there was significance. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but just note that there's more variability associated with site for Opiosum montium than we saw earlier for Grossmanni and Clavigera. This figure shows the way that Grossmanni and Clavigera captured resources depending on competition treatment, um, or the percentage of resource capture. The y-axis is percent resource capture, x-axis is temperature. Once again, the gray are intraspecific, the black are intraspecific, and different letters indicate significant differences between these two means. So for this model, competition treatment was significant with more resource capture occurring during intraspecific competition competing with Opiosma montium than competing with itself. I wanted to know what temperatures these occurred at specifically so the interaction between temperature and competition treatment allowed me to find that at 10 degrees and 15 degrees, Grossmannia clavigera captures a greater percentage of resources when it's growing with Opiosum montium than when it's growing alone. And then for Opiosum montium, the y-axis is once again percent resource capture, x is temperature. Temperature was significant. Um, Competition treatment was also significant, with greater resource capture occurring when Opiosum montium was growing with itself than when it was growing with the competitor, Grossmannia clavigera. I wanted to know what temperature specifically have this occurred at, so the interaction was able to show me that at 10 and 15 degrees, these temperatures right here, Opiosum montium captures more resources when it's growing with itself than when it's growing with Grossmannia clavigera. Temperature in site was also significant, but once again, the differences weren't between sites at the same temperature. They were within a site between temperatures. It's not biologically interesting. This figure shows the comparison between Grossmannia clavigera and Opiostoma montium during interspecific competition, when they're competing with each other. The y-axis is growth rate over time, um, and the x-axis is temperature. The red um, are Opiostoma montium, and the black are Grossmannia clavigera. And once again, the letters indicate significant differences. For this model, temperature was significant, and so was species, with Grossmannia clavigera 
capturing resources faster overall than opiostum amontium. When I looked at the interaction with temperature, I was able to see what temperatures this occurred at specifically. So if you look right here at 10 and 15 degrees specifically, Grossmannian clavigera captures a significantly captures resources significantly faster than opiostum amontium at these two temperatures, but not at these higher temperatures. Once again, temperature and site were um, significant action was significant, but the differences were not between sites. They were within sites. This figure shows percentage resource capture by the two species during interspecific competition. Opiostum amontiums in red, Grossmanni clavigera is in black. For this model, species was significant again, with Grossmanni clavigera capturing a greater percentage of resources overall than Opiostum amontium. I wanted to know what temperatures this occurred at specifically, and my post hoc test revealed that at 10, 15, and 25 degrees, um, Grossmanni clavigera captured a greater percentage of resources than Opiostum amontium. So moving along to explaining all of these results, um, I found that there was no evidence of interference competition backing up previous studies. The reason that I believe this is because if I look at these two figures, Grossmanni and Clavigera's growth rate, Opiosum and Montium's growth rate, for the two competition treatments, there's no significant differences in, in any of the temperatures, meaning that both fungi are able to grow at the same rate that they would with themselves as if they, uh, at, at the same rate as they are growing when they're growing towards each other, meaning that they don't sense each other. They're not somehow getting the signal that the other guy's there to speed up or slow down for some reason, which would occur during interference competition. So even though there was no evidence of in, um, interference competition, there was evidence of exploitation competition. So if you look at um, the percentage of resource capture for Opiostum amontium and Grossmannia clavigera, you kind of see that there are um, complementary results. Opiostum amontium does better at the lower temperatures when it's by itself or competing against itself. Grossmannia clavigera does better when it's competing against Opiostum amontium at the lower temperatures. When you look at this growth curve from the um, growth rate in isolation portion of the experiment, you see that Grossmannia clavigera grows faster at the lower temperatures. So if it's growing faster, it's going to capture resources before Opiostum amontium can get to them. However, this doesn't occur at the higher two temperatures. The differences are not significant there. And if you look at the growth rate in isolation, um, these are the temperatures where the two species capture resources at a comparable rate. So my conclusion is that my hypothesis was supported. There are differential temperature tolerances between the two species. And this is likely to facilitate a multipartite symbiosis between the two by allowing them to grow at different times. I found more genetic variability than has been found in the past, um, suggesting that there is potential for these two species to adapt as times change. This is especially true for Opiostum amontium. And given my results, I'd like to make a prediction. I think that Opiostum amontium will become more dominant um, through time. This is due to the fact that Opiostum amontium can capture resources faster and more frequently at 30 degrees than Grossmannia clavigera. And um, if temperatures continue to increase, we expect that Opiostum amontium will be able to capture more resources and possibly push Grossmannia clavigera out of symbiosis. This has negative effects on mountain pine beetle population dynamics, because as I discussed earlier, Opiostum amontium doesn't provide as much nitrogen as Grossmannia clavigera. So beetles that are feeding mainly on Opiostum amontium um, are likely to lay less eggs. So even though more beetles are surviving the winter because temperature's increasing, it's likely that if they're feeding only on Opiostum amontium, their egg, their clut sizes, sizes will be smaller. So the, the population would be expected to um, So my conclusions for the sporulation study, um, there was high variability in sporulation for both species. Um, I found it interesting that Opiostum amontium can sporulate at lower temperatures, but Grossmannia clavigera doesn't, um, which is very interesting considering that Opiostum amontium grows um, better during at warmer temperatures, but it can still produce spores at lower temperatures. But um, 
Sporulation was greatest for both species at 30 degrees, indicating that sporulation probably increases as temperature increases. My conclusions for the competition are that the fungi do not influence each other's growth prior to mating, and that uh, temperature does influence the outcome of exploitation competition, with Grossmannia clavigera dominating in cool temperatures, Ophiosma montian dominating in warmer temperatures, and neither of the two species dominating at intermediate temperatures. And because this occurs, this prevents exclusion of either of the two associates as temperatures fluctuate over time. And this is thought to contribute to the stability of this multipartite symbiosis with the mountain pine beetle. So I have a lot of gratitude for uh, David Affleck and Brian Still. They helped me with the data analysis on this project, and they were amazing. Um, a lot of people helped shape this project, Audrey Addison, uh, Barbara Benz, Jim Powell, as well as you guys, and the committee members, Corey, John, and Diana. And in addition, I had a bunch of amazing volunteers that helped me with data collection. Uh, thank you, Caleb, um, Joseph Caleb, <laughs> Pamela, Brenna, Dara, Emily, Austin, and Aspen. And thank you, Jack, for driving me to the lab at midnight <laughs> so much. <laughs> you guys have any questions? together and you didn't find them melanizing, were you able to tell if there was a higher density of the hyphae? It didn't look like it. It looked like it was kind of spindly. I mean, they were, they definitely had like captured resources there, but it, it looked, it looked spindly. It wasn't like a barrage zone where they like get denser. Was that observation, was that just a one point in time observation where right at the end of your study you noticed that it, or did you go back after like 10 days? I went back right after a month and there was still no melanization between okay. them. Really interesting. Brian? I'm interested in that same thing. Um, so in that experiment, I'm sorry, I'm a little, I'm forgetting a little bit, but were those clones that were being tested against each other? Mm -hmm. So basically those are the same genetic individual right. that are coming back into contact exactly. with each other. Yes, Jeff? Is, is the, the fungus that grows at the higher temperature, is it also responsible for staining? They both create blue stain. Okay. It's normally known as blue stain. It looks like brown stain in culture, but yeah, they both stain. <laughs> so if it continues to warm, you know, as it's predicted, can you think of any way that can hang in there. It did show a lot of variability, so there is potential for the isolates of Grossmannia clavigera that can grow at higher temperatures to be more um, prominent in the population. Anything about the environment or just in general that would maybe allow it to Well, there's differences between um, locations. Like, as it gets warmer in one area, it might be cooler in a different location. So you might see more Grossmannia clavigera at higher elevations, for example, or higher latitudes. Where will it be published, your study? Oh, I don't know. We haven't even started talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking mycological of my <laughs> Yes, Brian? Um, so given these, the fact that they seem to do better at different temperatures, is there anything in the literature about, or anything that you've seen that the one fungus is maybe more prevalent on the south-facing side of the tree and the other fungus is maybe more prevalent on the north-facing side of the tree? Hmm, not that I recall at this moment, though I feel like there must be some studies looking at that. How about uh, yours? What? How about yours? Oh, there was a field component of the study, but we haven't... <laughs> <laughs> well, we tried to look at that. That was one of the things we were attempting to look at, but it didn't quite work out. No, I mean, there's two sites. Well, it worked out for the stump site, but yeah. for the Lufrex site, um, we, we like split the tree into north and south to look at um, the fungus on both sides, but... Results have not come in yet. I have one more question. Yeah. Sorry. Of course you do. Um, <laughs> so I, and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at this yet. This is just something that I you know brought up when you had mentioned this before. But have you had a chance to look and see 
if those particular genotypes appear no, to have... No, I haven't looked at that yet. Okay, so my question was going to be that there appear to be some of those genotypes are more adapted to, say, a warm temperature. There's a trade-off, basically. It grows better. Yeah. It like even grows money for bigger or something. Maybe grows really good at one temperature, but then decreases at lower temperature or something like that. Is that clear to everyone? Even though, like, the average, there was an average temperature profile, if we look at individual isolates, they might show different temperature profiles with some of the same species. Thank you.